The agreement between Russia and Ukraine to allow the shipping of food grain and fertilizers has ended. What does this mean for peace and for global food security? Tunisia and the European Union claim to have come to a new understanding on steps to be taken to ta tackle immigration via what Europe calls illegal routes. While this is being billed as a step to hurt human trafficking or human traffickers, we ask how it will affect the thousands who are forced to leave home in the hope of staying alive. And at Wimbledon, we have uh, new champions, which is always, of course, a good sign uh, as far as the health of the sport is concerned. But is this the much-awaited generational change of guard? Sharda Ugra, the world-famous sports writer, will tell us what she thinks. Uh, you're watching The Daily Debrief, coming to you, as always, from the People's Dispatch Studios here in New Delhi. I'm Siddhant Ani, and on the show today, first up, in another blow to the prospect of peace in Eastern Europe, as well as to global food security, the agreement between Russia and Ukraine to allow shipments of food grain as well as fertilizers uh, to be shipped through, of course, Turkish as well as Russian-controlled waters stands terminated. The last ship left Ukraine on Sunday, uh, bringing the total up to 32 million tons of material that Russia has allowed to be shipped out since the deal came into force in July last year. Abdul is with us in, stu in the studio and covers uh, some of these subjects for People's Dispatch. Uh, Abdul. Explain to us why the deal fell apart. It took so long to broker the UN as well as Turkey had to come together to bring the two parties to the table. Uh, Russia, of course, the Kremlin claiming that its side of the, the yeah. bargain has not been maintained. And that is the primary reason. If you see, Russia has been pushing for, there are many, earlier the details were not there, but now the details are out. And one specific demand which Russians had put when the deal was finalized last year in July was the basically uh, revocation of uh, Russian Agricultural Bank's uh, delinking from the SWIFT uh, payment system. Mm. Once the payment system, it was delinked because of the sanctions imposed on Russia by European Union and the US since uh, the war in Ukraine started, mm. uh, of course, that Russian's export of its own agricultural products became much more difficult yeah. because the payment of most of the countries come through the right SWIFT uh, system. Uh, system. Right. So they had demanded that they will allow the, uh, the grain export from Ukraine through the Black Sea in return that the Russian Agricultural Bank is de uh, linked again yeah. to the SWIFT Given system. the ability to basically exactly. transact. So that was the one of the main uh, reasons cited by the Russians for, uh, in fact, Putin, when he spoke on Thursday, uh, he basically specified these uh, a part of uh, Russian concern. Mm. The other important uh, element, of course, was uh, uh, Russia's concern that the deal was signed primarily uh, to uh, ease the uh, food prices, global food prices, to help uh, uh, the poorer countries in Africa in particular. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, which were suffering, which are still suffering from the high uh, food grain prices uh, because they are predominantly uh, dependent, uh, dependent on, on uh, grains from Ukraine and Russia. Hmm. Uh, instead of exporting the grains to the poorer countries, 40% hmm. uh, of all the grain went to Western Europe, the richest countries on the globe. Hmm. And that basically Russia has been raising this issue each time when the next, there was an extension coming, Russia reiterated these demands. Uh, apparently, none of these demands were addressed. And that is the reason, basically, uh, after giving an ultimatum yeah. on Thursday yeah. uh, and seeing that nothing is coming, uh, nothing concrete is coming. As per the reports, UN uh, General Secretary had offered mm. that instead of Russian Agricultural Bank, one of the subsidiaries mm. will be linked to the SWIFT. Mm. It seems Russians were not happy with that, and then that is uh, became the reasons for the, the termination from their part. Mm. So, so in the context of who entered into this agreement in the first place and who is imposing the sanctions, there, there's a gap. Yeah, uh, exactly. clearly, right. Mm. So, while the UN may be uh, justifiably concerned about uh, global food prices and global food security, and we talked about the FAO's most recent report on the show yeah. earlier. Uh, indicating how much of an impact actually this war has had on that specific subject. Uh, the EU and its allies have a seemingly different perspective on things. Of course, uh, it seems uh, that they are not even ready to understand uh, 
this particular it seems russia had the only responsibility to understand the uh, uh, food crisis or the food insecurity in the world mm. and rich european countries do not have any responsibility mm. they will not lift the sanctions they will not uh, uh, relink a russian agriculture bank to the swift but uh, and also they will take a, a larger chunk of the grain exported from ukraine mm. after the agreement they will get the benefits yeah. of it and yet they will have uh, their policies intact vis-a-vis -vis russia so their part of the bar uh, bargain is not uh, there so that seems to be a quite hypocritical from a russian point of view or a, a point of view which is not part of this uh, neutral perspective, neutral right, perspective yeah. of course uh, and that basically becomes the issue uh, it is nobody can deny the europeans uh, also when they talk about uh, rising in food insecurity of course they are also now increasingly being affected because yeah, feeling, of the, feeling the, the the idea of the uh, cost of living crisis mm. emerging their working class demonstrating on the ground mm. uh, of course for the first time even the western europe and in uh, northern africa the food is insecurity is rising as we discussed about yeah. when we talked yeah. about the fao report mm. so yes they are also affected mm. but the effect on the larger global south in particular and african countries which are predominantly as yeah. as, as we as said before are Much relying on right. uh, the green uh, exports from ukraine and russia in european needs to understand that the sanctioning Ru sanctioning russia is not hurting russia as much as it is hurting the poorer Reason countries in africa mm -hmm. and that realization apparently it seems that the un general secretary who talks about food insecurity on each every occasion possible was failed to convey it to the european uh, 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 european union members mm. and convince them to take this step to uh, uh, address the russian concerns and that failure of course is a failure of the global uh, diplomacy yeah. it is not a failure of an individual of course all right uh, thank you abdul i think we'll we we'll leave it there on this uh, for now except uh, unless uh, maybe you can also broadly uh, just point out to us in case it's not clear but uh, for, again from a neutral perspective does it seem like a further step in a continual process of escalation see in last few uh, at least weeks if you see there is a, a escalation from both pr primarily from the nato side mm. uh, that ukrainian uh, talk about ukrainian becoming a member of course they were not invited fully but that is there mm. that has been raised despite the objections and that being one of the root causes issues. for the uh, war conflict, yeah. then the uh, supply of uh, 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 what do you call it uh, cluster bombs uh despite Russia, russian objections despite the objections raised by majority of the global countries mm -hmm. and uh, so, and human rights organizations uh and uh, if you see today all there was an attack on the uh, bridge which links with crimea and uh, uh, uh russia mm -hmm. mainland russia mm -hmm. uh, so there is counter offensive going on uh, there is no initiative uh for dialogue and all the initiatives created by uh, made by uh, countries in africa or countries uh, like china and other uh, mem uh, global members of the global community have been shot down mm. by the us and the nato uh, uh, members so there is a complete uh, lack of any initiative to find a solution to the conflict and over and above that there is then there are provocative steps taken one after the other mm. so russians uh, um of course if, if you see it from them from outside russians seems to have no other option but to kind of take kind of retaliate in whatever way yeah. they can in the same kind of vein also uh, abdul we are uh, also speaking about an issue which is in, in some ways connected uh, and also pertains to the european union so we'll ask you to stick around for 30 seconds uh, the hawkish head of the eu of course ursula von der leyen Uh, along with Italy's right-wing leader Giorgia Meloni and Dutch Prime Minister Mark Rutte, uh, held talks with Tunisian President Kai Saied in response to the growing number of refugees and asylum seekers looking to get across the sea and find a better sort of life and liberty in Europe. Of course, that is the promise. That is the dream. Uh, Abdul, 
given uh, the sort of vibe that you might have felt if you were in the room <laughs> with these uh, leaders uh, of today, uh, what are uh, sort of what, what are the terms of this uh, new memorandum of understanding between Tunisia and uh, the EU and then we can maybe talk about uh, the whole approach towards this process of migration. Well, the details are not yet out. Uh, we don't know the nitty gritties of it, but given the experience we have, uh, where EU's deals with Libya and its earlier deal with, uh, uh, older deal with Turkey. Mm. Of course, Turkey's deal is is different in nature, but that the basic issue remains the same. Yeah. The Europeans want to discourage or prevent uh, people coming to its shores seeking asylum. Mm. And for that, they are ready to fund whichever country in whatever way possible is ready to, willing to do their job of patrolling their borders. Uh, and that means uh, uh, taking whatever measures possible in violation of whatever human rights we talk about. Mm. So exactly that is what has happened. The, if you read the announcement made by uh, Vendor, Lean and uh, uh, the Prime Minister of the, uh, the Dutch, uh, Dutch Prime Minister yeah. or the Italian uh, Prime Minister, all of them have reiterated that um, part of the uh, 900 uh, plus million euros will go to uh, 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 building a kind of border security arrangement mechanism inside Tunisia. Hmm. That was the primary announcement. Of course, they are they also sugarcoated the this particular aspect of the deal with other, uh, uh, for example, Tunisia is suffering from economic crisis. So they are basically saying that a part of this uh, 900 plus billion euros will go to uh, uh, kind of addressing some of the economic concerns in Tunisia. It will also uh, provide a, a, that part of the money will go for the re, uh, you can say, branding or re reviving the Tunisian education system, primarily the school building, hmm. and some scholarship for Tunisian students to go to Europe and exchange. Hmm. That is, these, these are the things which have been uh, identified, announced. Hmm. announced. But the primary objective remains how to control uh, the, the flow of migrants from uh, uh, Tunisia across the Mediterranean to Italy in particular. Italy, for example, yesterday or some days, few days back, uh, issued a statement according to which the, the number of migrants, immigrants to Italy has increased to 75,000 uh, since the beginning of the year mm. in comparison to 31,000 uh, last That's year, so. the whole year. Of, so according to them, this is a big... Uh, 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 flood of migrants coming in uh, Europe hmm. and they want to prevent it as much as possible. Right, because 900 billion dollars might not be able to help to solve the problem at their end, of course. <laughs> <laughs> That's their thinking, yeah. yeah. So, so which brings us to the conditions, uh, perhaps, uh, Abdul, and maybe that's most pertinent to talk about, uh, under which this uh, sort of wave of uh, migration is happening and what you were referring to, you know, the kind of support that uh, these governments, the European Union mm. extends to governments that make it more difficult for people to stay, to live, to earn a livelihood as well as to exactly. express uh, whatever it is that they need to in their own countries. That is why primarily they are leaving. Exactly. So what is the situation in Tunisia? Uh, we haven't it's touched on it for a while. I yeah, think. that is very important. If you see, ever since uh, Kai Said came to power, there has been an attempt to, I, and of course, this is a diversionary uh, tactic used by most of the uh, rulers across the world uh, to kind of uh, whip up uh, anti-immigrant sentiment in Tunisia. And uh, particularly against the sub, uh, immigrants coming from sub-Saharan Africa. Mm. There have been uh, reported cases of, of rise in uh, racial hatred and violence in Tunisia since Kai Said gave a statement mm. claiming that the uh, migrants from Sub-Saharan Afri Sub Africa coming to Tunisia to change the overall character of Tunisia uh, uh, to make it more of an African country than an Arab country. Yeah. The, the, the irony is Tunisia is an African country, no matter what uh, Kai Said thinks. Uh, anyway, so that became, a, despite the fact that 
this has been opposed by the human rights groups and the left parties in inside Tunisia. A larger uh, group, there has been an increase of uh, violence against immigrants. Oh. And recently, uh, on July, first week, in uh, first week of July, uh, uh, hundreds of migrants were pushed out of Tunisia's second largest city and uh, pushed uh, out of, in fact, Tunisia to the borders of Libya or Algeria. Mm. And according to the Red Cross there, uh, around 600 people have been sheltered by it. So you can understand the extent of it, mm. that basically the, the rise of hatred and of course uh, uh, the larger continent continent's economic condition, result of the longer periods of colonial and imperial practices inside the continent mm. has created a situation where the hundreds of people come to Tunisia and Libya in particular to migrate to Europe. Uh, and this hatred, rising hatred, also creates an additional pressure on the people who were not ready to, earlier they were not ready to move out of Tunisia, they were not willing to go anywhere else at least. For now, they are forced to kind of take the desperate measure and move out of Tunisia and go to Europe. Mm. So this push and pull, whatever you call it, basically creates a situation where hundreds of people die every year uh, uh, by drowning in the Mediterranean Sea, sometimes starving because their boat is stranded uh, in the sea For without any food it. and any water. Yeah. So the, the human tragedy is uh, big, but Europeans only think about uh, uh, their own immediate uh, concerns, which is basically coming of the migrants will mean the quote unquote economic issues in the according to their own uh, uh, calculations mm. as you rightly pointed out 900 million dollars could have been used to build infrastructure or build opportunities for these uh, asylum seekers mm. in their own countries mm. but instead of doing that that is more of a cultural or strengthen reaction. other aspects of their own economy to give uh, who they consider their exactly. own people jobs and, exactly. and other opportunities so it's I most know. of a reactionary xenophobic yeah. uh, xenophobic reaction than economic uh, uh, concerns. Soundly. Yeah. 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 So th that is quite obvious. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and this deal again proves it. All right. Thanks very much, Abdul. Uh, we leave it there for today. Thanks for uh, setting up our Monday episode of Daily Debrief. Uh, and finally, though, uh, not all doom and gloom. Uh, we also like to throw in a bit of distraction uh, where we can. And, and what better than uh, Wimbledon, I guess, on, on this occasion. The men's final happened on Sunday uh, and the women's final the day before that on Saturday along with, of course, uh, doubles and mixed doubles and all the rest of it. Uh, on the men's side, there, on both sides, of course, there are new champions. But on the men's side, uh, for the first time in over 10 years, Novak Djokovic lost a game at centre court and 20-year-old Carlos Alcaraz from Spain, the reigning world number one, is the new Wimbledon champion. Uh, Shada Ugra joins us via video conference to talk about both uh, the men and women's tournaments and whether uh, finally we might see the change of guard that we've been waiting for in the sport of tennis for quite a while. Uh, Shada, back to back episodes of the show that we've had you on. I think this is the best we've done in a long time. Uh, first up, the women's side of, and we, we look at only singles because, of course, we have uh, just a short amount of time on the show. Uh, Marketa Vondrusova of the Czech Republic becoming the first unseeded player, of course, in the professional era to win Wimbledon. Uh, is it like we've been looking at women's tennis as being uh, the more open and competitive of the two draws, uh, at least as far as singles is concerned? Is this something that has been uh, sort of reiterated? And, and also, if, if you can add a little bit on Ons Jabo losing again uh, uh, in the final at, at the last step. Uh, what uh, that might be like. Um, hi, hi, Siddhan. Uh, yeah, you know, everyone seemed to be waiting for Ons Jabbar to win for so many reasons other than the fact that she's an incredibly creative and incredibly watchable player. But uh, Marketa Vondrusova's story in itself, uh, the fact that a year ago she was injured, she was walking around with a cast, she had wrist surgery. Uh, it is reflective of the women's game that it's actually far more even spread out the talent. And you can see that this is not a top uh, top 10 player, you know, this is mm -hmm. someone from outside the um, uh, sort of uh, the, the elite uh, ranks of the of the game. 
but was able to play with such a uh, great calmness and confidence and athleticism i think what we are always reminded about the women's game when you watch the final is the elevation of athleticism to where it is today uh, ons jabbar i think is is a very very popular fav- uh, uh, player she is a favorite for everyone and uh, like she keeps saying her time will come but in the sense the pressure on her was uh, perhaps what made wondersova play just the most beautiful flowing uh, uh, kind of a game and we were able to see her skills and her, her athleticism and her utter calmness uh, through everything uh, except the last when she was serving uh, for the for the final but before that she was just completely in control yeah, bound to be a, a, a bit of I, i suppose butterflies jitters whatever you want to call it when you're you know just almost there uh but moving ahead to to the men's side of things carlos alcaraz also you thought might have the same but uh in that sense he did the opposite right at the end firstly uh taking a set off novak djokovic in a tie break right which hasn't happened much uh, this year at least not in the bigs uh and then sort of in the final set holding his own uh showing the kind of composure that you're talking about the calmness and of course playing an incredibly athletic and i mean at some points like absolutely ridiculous tennis as well yeah ridiculous tennis was the thing i think he's learned from what happened uh, in his last uh, uh, sort of encounter uh, with uh, novak djokovic and uh, a lot of us were discussing about the pressure of playing djokovic itself you know you mm. you said uh, uh, going by what yanik sinner said they're so respectful of the competitor that they're going to uh, face as face, was yeah, yeah. carlos alcaraz before the final but he held his nerve and he was able to raise the standard of his game to match that of djokovic djokovic made one ginormous error in the at the start of the uh, i mean unforced error at the start of the uh, of the set he could have gone up to love and then uh, you never know how he goes there but alcaraz was able to pull everything back and then produce those incredible returns and incredible passing shots and you're thinking um that it was like he was ready for the day he was ready. he has a grand slam title with him but all the boxes that had to be that you thought yeah. that couldn't be ticked off novak djokovic playing against him uh, he did all of that and and in fine style and i think uh, uh, other than uh, and just competed both of them for for a change not not for a change um, sort of competed with a great deal of respect for each other as well you know with age and and all the rest of it that went it was a lovely final to watch so uh, yeah it, it was it was indeed a, a great final to watch and and which you know it's something that again we we said we would touch on so we will uh does it now indicate that this generation there's so many uh, young uh, players in the mix whether it's holger rune uh, of course alcaraz himself so many other young guys 20 21 22 23 uh is there now a chance of like looking at more of them maturing uh, and actually it being that generational shift that we talked about so often <laughs> i know the generation shift we've been waiting for for, for almost an, an one or two generations literally yeah. spoken of somebody but uh, i think alcaraz has literally broken away from this pack and now everyone has to catch him uh, even though sort of the the old guys will be around that is uh, yeah. djokovic uh, i think alcaraz he's won two grand slams and the one that he won against djokovic i think this time is a big breakthrough you've seen people put in really good performances in say an earlier round victory or mm. in another tournament you know in an mm. in an mm. atp event but for alcaraz to pull this up at a slam he said they never mind the new generation i'm now beat me i'm the person to be beaten and he's just yeah. 20 years old uh, it'll be a huge uh, everyone all the superstars all the gen next guys have to now catch up with him and play the kind of game uh, that's there because he set the standard uh, say for the next oh, i don't know how many years now we kept thinking it was 10 but uh, the, the 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 big 3 have made it last almost 15 you know yeah. so so there's no saying but right. thanks very much uh, alcaraz of course at uh, just a little over 20 becoming the third youngest uh, to win the men's single title at wimbledon after of course 17 year old boris becker and the legendary bjorn borg uh, thank you sharda always a pleasure talking to you uh, and uh, also with that we'll bring to a close this episode of the show thank you for watching uh, today's show as always Uh, we also invite you to head to our website peoplesdispatch.org for details on these stories and all of the other work we do uh, and also follow us on social media uh, for regular updates we'll be back same time same place tomorrow until then stay safe goodbye